Well, good day, everyone. My name is Kerry Potter. I'm the BMP coordinator for the Alabama Forestry Commission, and I am coming to you from our state office in Montgomery, uh, where I'm recording this PowerPoint presentation on Alabama BMPs more especially our working forest, wildlife, and sustainability. This is for your PLM training course, and I will be going into talking more in depth about uh, water quality, streams, types of streams, and uh, your, your basic BMPs in general. So let's talk about the importance of water because it's very important uh, for our existence uh, you know, on an everyday basis. Over 50% of the drinking water in the U.S. comes from forested watersheds. That's a lot of different streams, creeks, and rivers flowing through our state. Uh, more approximately, this number is going to be 132,419 miles of creeks, streams, and rivers. This figure was increased from 77,000 just think about there's more freshwater biodiversity in the state of Alabama than any other state. There are certain aquatic species that are only found in Alabama. When you consider this, think of several of the uh, Midwestern states which you know, don't even compare with Alabama. You could take five or six different uh, Midwest states and they, they do not come close to the many species or the biodiversity that's found within the state of Alabama. So what are BMPs? BMPs are best management practices. And Alabama follows the BMPs uh, for forestry, which are non-regulatory guidelines, which means these are not mandatory guidelines, but they are followed to protect water quality within the state. There are 15 federally mandated BMPs that are uh, regulated, and these concern the, the federal wetlands that exist in Alabama and what you can do as far as your best management practices within these wetland areas. The Alabama BMPs were suggested to help Alabama's forestry community maintain and protect the physical, chemical, and biological integrity of waters of the state as required by federal and state laws. These federal and state laws uh, that, that we're talking about uh, encompass the Federal Water Pollution Act, the Clean Water Act, the Water Quality Act, and the Coastal Zone Management Act. Uh, within Alabama, we have our Alabama Water Pollution Control Act. These are all acts that are uh, very uh, influential in keeping the waters of our state uh, clean and, and not polluted. So, uh, BMPs are, are no longer voluntary. Uh, they're suggested that you follow to protect our, our water quality within the state, but there are certain member companies that must follow BMP standards by written contract with dealer and supplier. These are mainly your pulp mills in Alabama that are under the SFI or FSC or PEFC standard. SFI stands for Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Uh, what this means to you as a logger and landowner is that you know, these mills are constantly checking the tracks that are cut on your properties or the properties that you cut to maintain, to make sure that BMPs are being followed uh, when you're harvesting timber. Uh, if you're not maintaining the BMPs or are in compliance with the state BMPs, these mills can choose to not take wood from you and that could really affect you as a company. If we have any unresolved BMP complaints, these are reported to the SIC, which is the SI, uh, Sustainability Implementation Committee and member companies and uh, consequences can be severe. Uh, SIC, uh, SIC committee uh, has mill representatives that reside on the committee and so they know about any of the complaints that happen, uh, especially if they're severe complaints that are unresolved. There have been two unsuccessful court cases attempted to require a permit for all forest roads as point services. 
right now all forestry, uh, civil cultural logging activities uh, related around logging are non-point sources. So you may ask, what's the difference between a point source and a non-point source? A point source is something that, hey, you can point your finger at and say, hey, that is the definite reason that pollution is entering a stream. Now with logging and uh, practices and, and best management practices of the state, we have several different guidelines we use for roads, uh, loading decks, logging sites, streams, SMZs that protect the, the water quality and make sure that you know any, any, any source of pollution will be a non-point source. Uh, which if you're following your BMPs and you're doing everything that you're supposed to be doing, you don't have any problems with any uh, pollution source getting into the stream. The EPA recently ruled that permitting of all forest roads was not necessary because of success in BMPs and protecting water quality. This is why BMP uh, implementation is so important. So we do not get the federal government involved with our state affairs with uh, logging practices and start you know implementing federal laws that apply to you know how you cut your how you cut your timber because uh, we already have BMPs in place that do that so that's why following BMPs is so important you know with all your your forest harvesting activities uh, ADM states that BMPs must be maintained until the site is fully revegetated. That means all of your BMP work on roads, whether it's water bars, turnouts, your grading of the roads, your skid trail, water retention devices, your SMZ zones, streamside management zones. If you have a, a perennial stream, do you have the right buffer, you know, on either side of the stream bank? which should be 35 feet. All of these, all these different BMPs must be maintained until the, the track is able to green up and be fully vegetated. So let's talk about the Endangered Species Act and BMPs. Uh, endangered species, uh, there's certain lawsuits against the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that continue to exist. At this point, there are over 250 imperiled species that reside in the rivers, streams, creeks in Alabama. A 13 uh, of these are aquatic, which are your, your fish, mussels, crayfish, and snails. BMPs, especially SMZs, your streamside management zones, are the key to avoid reg regulation, uh, regulation in SHUs. Those are your strategic habitat units. Like I said earlier, following BMP ensures that you know you pr you're protecting these imperiled uh, and endangered species that exist within the state. If you're doing everything you should do with your 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 SMZs, your streamside management zones, protecting your 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 streams, then you shouldn't have any problems you know uh, endangering any of these species. Uh, the Trump administra administration has also pledged to revise the listing process. So in the future, you might see more and more species added to this list. And so that's why it's so important to follow BMPs uh, so you don't have any regulatory issues with the U.S. Fisheries and Wildlife Service. Because if you go in and you start, uh, you know, uh, threatening these streams by, you know, making your SMZs smaller where they should be wider and causing problems with these endangered species or imperiled species, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service can come in and issue some pretty significant fines uh, which are really going to hurt. And these threatened and endangered species uh, and the water quality concerns are not going away. Uh, these, these concerns are, and issues are going to get worse and worse as time goes by unless these BMPs are adequately followed. So what are some of your pollutants? Well, some of your silvicultural non-point source pollutants 
would be sediment, organic materials, uh, temperature, trash, pesticides, and nutrients. Uh, these are some of the main pollutant sources that can get in your streams. Uh, temperature is more of a water quality or water temperature issue where if you cut too many trees along a major stream or creek, uh, it's going to change the temperature of that stream and it can en endanger some of the aquatic species that live there. Uh, trash, uh, that would be you know, just trash from logging operations. Uh, uh, hydraulic buckets, you, know, you want to keep those in a container and off the property, you know, and away from these streams where they can, and up on sites where they can get into the streams. Nutrient flow, that's some of your, uh, um, your fertilizers. Um, all of these contribute, you know, to, you know, polluting the waters of the state. We want to make sure that we keep these out of the, the streams and creeks and rivers and uh, away from you know causing any source of pollution. So BMP standards in Alabama, uh, our Alabama's best management practices for forestry involve several different core areas. Uh, these are your streamside management zones or SMZs. These are the buffers on either side of a, a, a perennial stream uh, bank, uh, your stream crossings, your forest roads, timber harvesting, reforestation stand management, forested wetland management where you have uh, federal wetlands uh, where they exist, and then revegetation and stabilization. This is some of your remediation work in case you have any BMP issues or problems. Remember, always think and plan before you act. Always have a plan in place before uh, you start your logging uh, operation. Uh, a good idea is to have a pre-harvest plan in place to where you know where all of your loading decks should be, uh, where your roads should be. If there's a stream that exists on the property, uh, and it's a perennial stream, intermittent stream, or ephemeral, which we'll get into uh, later on. Make sure that these are properly marked, you know, before you start your, your timber harvest. So always think and plan before you act. So what is a streamside management zone? This is a strip of land immediately adjacent to the waters of the state where soils, organic material matter, and vegetation are managed to prevent pollutants from forestry operations. This is kind of your buffer that keeps all of these materials out of your, your stream. This is required for perennial, the SMZ is required for perennial, and that's a 35 foot buffer on perennial streams per side, so 70 feet total. And this is recommended for in, intermittent streams as well. Uh, so what is a stream? A stream consists of a bed, uh, a bank, and a high water mark. Your bed is where the water flows through and your banks contain the water. It's always recommended that a consultant forester, uh, a registered forester, uh, mark or flag the SMZs before harvest. I always suggest this with uh, a lot of tracks that I do inspections on. You know, uh, do, is the SMZ marked? Um, have they made an effort to go in and paint or mark the lines with flagging where the SMZ exists? It's always a good idea to uh, have this policy in place before you start harvesting a track. And you also need to keep your roads and log index outside the SMZs. Uh, another main point I'll, I'll expand on is uh, do not skid uh, parallel with your SMZs. Try to come in uh, at uh, perpendicular angles to your SMZs where you have to harvest timber. And whatever you do, do not skid right down the bank of an SMZ. I've seen this a lot in the past and it's sort of becoming a problem that I found with a lot of tracks that I look at. So here's a an aerial photo of an SMZ. 
In the middle of the photo, you can see the perennial stream. This is a main creek or stream that goes through that property. And these little feeders off of it are, are either intermittent or ephemeral streams that tie into that main stream. And it's always good to protect those ephemeral and intermittent areas too because you know any source of pollution that can get into those streams, these little feeder streams, are going to go straight to your uh, major perennial stream and cause pollution problems down the road. So let's talk a little bit more about perennial streams and SMZs. Perennial streams flow year-round under normal weather conditions. They'll have a definite bed, a bank, and a high water mark. Uh, these are usually specified or, or found on as a solid blue line on a topo or USGS quad map. You should leave a 35-foot minimum SMZ width on either side of the bank. And when I, when I state or emphasize minimum, uh, if you have a lot of slope uh, involved with the, the stream, the SMZ, um, you should probably allow for a little bit wider SMZ, uh, especially where slope is involved. Um, this SMZ width can be increased if, with the landowner objectives. Uh, on-site conditions and stream sensitiv civ uh, sensitivity. Excuse me. You also need to take into consideration soil erodibility, soil equipment limitations, slope, like I've talked about, and topography. Uh, another thing to consider is where these streams may exit. You know, if you have a major stream going into a major tributary or a waterway, such as a river might be a good idea to leave a wider SMZ just to ensure that you don't have any chance of any sediment or pollution getting into the stream and going straight to the river. Within these perennial streams you should leave 50% uh, you can leave a 50% crown cover and, and harvest timber within within these uh, buffer areas. Just remember that you need to selectively uh, mark the trees out of these buffer areas and make sure that 50 Fifty percent of the crown cover is left. Also, it's important to take out all the any any uh, residual logging debris that may have found its way into the water of the stream. So, whatever goes in the water must come out. This is a photo of an SMZ that has been selectively harvested. You can see in the photo that the, where the stream bed and the bank is, none of the trees have been cut along the edge of the bank. Uh, and you have trees, you have a good vegetative layer and a good, good crown uh, closure left within that buffer zone. This is an incorrect SMZ that was left on a perennial stream. On the far left side of the slide, you can see the stream bed, the bank, and then actually a tree right in the middle of the slide that was cut right there close to the edge of the bank. The big difference in this picture between the last, you see that you know 50% crown closure was not left. Uh, that tree that was cut in the middle probably should have been left, or definitely should have been left, excuse me. And you should have marked your buffer uh, where you, you leave these trees and you know where your buffer zone is. I see this a lot with a lot of the complaints that I have within the state. So number one, always mark your perennial SMZ buffers. Uh, number two, it's a good idea to go in. If you're going to selectively remove trees within that buffer, just go ahead and mark those trees, either paint them or flag them, so you can get an idea of what's going to come out of that SMZ buffer. It's another picture of an inc incorrect SMZ buffer that was left. You can see that 50% of the crown closure was not left uh, within this buffer. You know, he, they left a few trees, but uh, this is going to cause 
problems with sediment getting into the stream. It's going to cause temperature problems, which I talked about earlier, that can change the temperature of that, temperature of that stream and endanger you know, any of the aquatic species that are living there. Uh, so you run into uh, risk of having really big problems, not only with water quality, but also with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, coming to you and saying, hey, you've uh, just put another species on the extinction list. Uh, we, we have uh, some fines that we want to deal out to you. So what, what are you going to accomplish from, you know, cutting a few trees within that SMZ or cutting most of those out? What is that? Maybe uh, a quarter of a load per acre or every five acres. So it's a good idea just to leave these buffers intact uh, at, all, at all possible. <clears throat> So we, we've talked about perennial streams. Let's talk about intermittent streams. Intermittent streams flow part of the year, uh, and they'll have a, a bank and a bed, but may not have a high water mark. Uh, these show up as a dashed blue line on your topo map or USGS quad, and they may or may not show up. You know, a lot of these maps are kind of outdated, and you, you don't see some of these that exist. Uh, there is a, you can have a partial cut or regeneration cut uh, within these, with these intermittent streams if the water quality, you know, for the stream is protected. That means uh, you, can, you can actually cut the timber on either side of these intermittent streams, but you must protect that buffer area and make sure there's a vegetative layer that's left. Um, we've got to have this vegetative ground cover and organic debris. To, uh, to protect the forest floor and to keep that buffer that exists to keep uh, any sediment from flowing into the stream. If there's no canopy cover uh, that is left, make sure that uh, your vegetative ground cover is left. And if you do cut within these intermittent streams and, and you remove soil or you disrupt soil, make sure this is fixed before you leave these areas. You have to put in some uh, hay bales, uh, spread some hay, some grass seed, uh, put in some silt fencing. Just make sure that sediment cannot get uh, into this stream in any way. Here are some examples of incorrect SMZs that were left. Uh, a lot of these are, are dealing with perennial type streams. Uh, the upper, the top left, um, you can see that some sediment, some debris was left within, within that stream bed. Um, same thing on the middle slide, plus you can see where they've disrupted that vegetative layer, that buffer right next to the stream, and by running a skitter right next to it, and this opens up the possibility of sediment getting into the stream. You can actually see in that middle slide on the bottom part of the slide where sediment is actually getting into the stream and causing it to be silted in or turbid. On the bottom right, that's another uh, example of an intermittent where they're leaving debris within the stream that's going to have to come out. That water's got to be able to flow uh, to move the, the water off that property. And it, it's got to be in a state where you don't have sediment getting into that intermittent stream. So ephemeral streams are our last type of stream that we'll talk about. Uh, ephemeral streams are your shallow ditches or depressions. They're usually dry most of the year. Usually only, the only time you see the, these are within wet areas or flooding type areas. And these transport the water, you know, off the track, you know, into probably an intermittent or perennial stream. They may or may not have a defined bed or bank and will not have a high water mark. Uh, these are usually not identified on a topo, but you can uh, stay the, observe the, the contour lines on the, on the topo maps and see where these, these uh, ditches and cuts are, you know, uh, by your V-shaped lines on the topo map. These ephemeral streams do not require an SMZ 
uh, old canopy cover. cover. Uh, you do still need to use, uh, keep a vegetative cover or litter layer, um, you know, as a buffer on either side of the stream bed. Uh, remove any debris material within these ephemeral streams that could dam up and cause water to stop flowing. And another thing to consider is these streams can cause severe water quality issues if the banks are beaten down to bare mineral soil. Uh, what we're talking about there is, you know, these streams are transport vessels. These ephemerals are transport vessels that lead to intermittent and perennial streams. Um, so any sedimentation movement uh, that goes, that uh, is, is carried by these ephemeral streams can still reach these intermittent and perennial streams and cause problems if, if not uh, managed properly. Here we have a slide of an ephemeral stream with uh, no SMZ. Uh, as you can see in the slide, there's still a lot of debris left uh, within, within this ephemeral. As you see there's a, you know, the slope changes on either side of this ephemeral and, you know, a lot of this debris was left in here and you can see some uh, some movement of sedimentation in the middle of that slide. Here's some more examples where uh, top left, you left a lot of logging tops and debris within the ephemeral and a lot of times you're going to stop these up and cause problems with water flow. Um, you know, this should be pulled out and these, these uh, buffers along these uh, ephemerals protected. Try to make sure that you leave a good uh, buffer area. And it's always a good idea to leave, you know, a stringer of trees on either side, you know, just to make sure you have adequate protection for these ephemeral streams. Like I said earlier, uh, you know, these ephemeral intermittent streams, uh, they're going to flow to a major water source, you know, most of the time. They're going to go to a river. Uh, they're going to get a tributary that a lot of times these are feeding into ponds. So any sediment movement you have coming from uh, a track that you're cutting uh, is, is going off of that track onto your neighbors and this can be a major problem in silting in your neighbor's pond and the next thing you know you have a lawsuit because he stocked his pond with uh, you know Florida trophy bass and bluegill and, and you've you've killed all his fish within that pond. Well, now he's got an issue with it and a lot of times they're, they're going to hire attorneys and they're going to pursue it. I see a lot of complaints each year where the same thing happens. Uh, inadequate BMPs weren't being followed as far as streams and SMZs, uh, especially SMZ width. And this is what happened. Uh, your neighbor, a quarter mile, half mile, downstream had their pond silted in. So it's always a good idea to keep this under consideration in your planning stages uh, before you cut the track. Um, look at what's downstream from uh, some of the SMZs that you're going to have, some of the major streams that go through the track that you're cutting. Do they end up in someone's pond? Do they go to a major tributary or river uh, where they could cause problems? In these, these instances, it's probably a good uh, idea to leave a little bit wider SMZ than you normally would, just to make sure that you don't cause any of these problems down the road. Uh, like I just discussed, avoid these disturbance, disturbances where these drain areas join intermittent perennial streams. We've seen what, they, what kind of problems they will, will cause. ADM or Alabama Department of Environmental Management will consider old ag canals, ditches, and streams if they have been on the long landscape long enough to develop a distinct bed and bank. Uh, another telltale sign is if the ag canal or ditch has aquatic, you know, fish species, snails, uh, all those different critters and vegetation within it. Um, 
usually your fresh cut canals uh, will not have these. It's always a good idea to protect the vegetative layer on these regardless. But if you have an old ag ditch that's been there for a long time and you notice uh, minnows and, and uh, aquatic species within it, it's probably a good idea to leave a good buffer or a good uh, uh, tree, tree buffer along these ditches. These are certain slides of ag ditches that were ephemeral streams. Um, I don't know if you can see the top left slide. Uh, this ephemeral stream is all clogged up. There's actually an old bridge that goes across it. You can see the tops that are in it right there. That bottom left, uh, that, that one actually had some minnow species in it, uh, aquatic species. And uh, the middle right, that's, that's an old bridge going across another old uh, ag ditch that ended up being an ephemeral stream. And uh, it, was, it was pretty clogged up on either side. So I always plan and, and uh, plan for these, these situations to where you know where all your, your streams are, whether they're perennial, intermittent, or ephemeral, and uh, have a, a logging plan adjusted to that. All right, stream crossings. Uh, everybody has them uh, at some point in time. Uh, so the best thing is to avoid them if possible. Um, if you're cutting a 40 acre block and there's a SMZ right through the middle, a, big, a major stream right through the middle of that 40 acres and you can access it on either side of that stream, uh, it's a good idea to, to do so. Just, make, just to make sure you don't have, cause any problems by crossing the stream. So if, if you find where you can access you know, each side of the SMZ in some way or another, uh, it's a good idea to try to go ahead and do that. Uh, try to locate these stream crossings where the, the bank and the SMZ will be least disturbed if you have to, if you actually do have to put in a crossing. So you must allow for the normal passage of water and these aquatic species to make their way up and down the stream. So what I'm saying here is do not pile in a lot of dirt slash logging debris into these streams to where you dam up the stream until you're done logging. Uh, make sure that uh, water can flow while you are pulling wood uh, back and forth across an SMZ. So some of these log, uh, these stream crossings that we do are log crossings, fords or low water crossings. Um, culverts that we put in, um, bridges. Bridges are probably your uh, least intrusive uh, form of crossing. Uh, they can be a little costly sometimes, but they actually pay for themselves in the end instead of having to come back and do extra work pulling out crossings. You can pull these bridges out as you go, or these ramps that some people use and uh, you haven't affected the, the stream banks as much. You haven't put any debris into the streams. And that's the biggest thing I'm talking about here is not putting any more debris into the streams than you have to. Make sure uh, you know, all of that is pulled out. Of course, any temporary crossing must be removed. Uh, and when I say it must be removed, it should be completely pulled out and the ba uh, stream bank stabilized on either side. Uh, if there's a slope involved going down to these crossings, uh, you may need to put in some water bars, some turnouts, uh, put in a lot of extra slash. You may even have to put in some silt fencing, uh, just depending on you know, what the topography of that track suggests. But definitely all these permanent and temporary crossings must be stabilized. Uh, some of the material you can use for stream crossings, uh, log crossings is probably one of your easiest things to do. Just take your hollow or solid logs and put it into the channel um, and then come over the top of it with uh, some type of skid bridge or mat uh, if at all possible. 
But whatever you do, do not use limbs, brush, or dirt. Um, and remember, what with any of these crossings, what goes in must come out. Excuse me. Uh, this is a, a slide of one of your uh, well-implemented crossings. These are logs that were put in, uh, you know, linear, linear, linearly or lengthwise across uh, the stream. A lot of times you see them just put in uh, parallel within the stream bed and then a mat put over the, the logs to cross. Uh, the biggest thing is not to impede the water flow uh, so that you know, uh, aquatic species on either side of that crossing can't go back and forth. This is an example of a poor crossing. Uh, this is just logging slash debris, dirt uh, that's put in and it has dammed up this, this stream. And this will be a major pain to remove. And this is going to cost you extra time and money to make sure all this debris is pulled out of the stream bed and each individual approach on either side of the stream is stabilized. Here's another example of a poor crossing. Uh, this is one from North Alabama. This is just a lot of sticks, uh, tops, log and slash that was put in to cross over. Uh, this, is, this would probably been a good example of when to use a bridge or uh, you know, a culvert that you can put in and, and pull out. This is another example of a poor crossing. Fords, uh, Fords are can be used when the creek bed is firm. A lot of people use these uh, when there's a lot of rock that exists, you know, on streams, really rocky uh, bottom streams. Uh, it's a good idea to use these where the banks are low. You don't have any steep incline coming up to the, the, the stream banks. Uh, where these are used, the banks should be back bladed away from the channel and, and used to improve the approaches. That means using these to divert a lot of any sediment, sedimentation that can make its way into these crossings uh, to keep it away from there. You always use rock uh, to stabilize the stream bed. Uh, you can use a good uh, uh, policy or procedure to use is have your rip wrap put in and with some smaller rock on top to where the water can flow through naturally. Here's a good slide example of a, a well-implemented ford. Uh, so you want a whole lot of water in this creek anyway, but it's able to flow uh, across the bottom of, of this ford. Uh, it's not impeded in any way. So that's, that's a good example of a ford to use. You've got lots of rock there. Uh, shouldn't have a problem with sediment getting into the stream. Culverts uh, should be used to reduce the potential for road washouts and impoundments of water. Culverts are usually best to use in permanent crossing type situations. Or uh, I know a lot of loggers carry around the, the, the metal or plastic culverts where they can put in, in uh, intermittent or perennial crossings where needed and then they can just pull them out when they come out. Um, if you look in our BMP manuals, you'll see the, the minimum size culvert that's recommended uh, in each individual use. And a lot of that's determined by the amount of watershed flow in it per area. Uh, one, one good idea or one great idea to use when using culverts is put in a one large uh, size, one bigger size than is recommended uh, when you're using the culverts. Y'all, you probably want to have one that's has a larger diameter uh, compared to one that's smaller uh, just to make sure that uh, you know the water flow is, is, is being allowed where these crossings exist. Uh, these culverts when they're put in should extend a minimum of one foot beyond the fill. Uh, the fill material should be stabilized with sandbags, rock, or veg vegetation. One, one of the things I see the most is using rock, you know, with these crossings. Uh, it's a good idea to stabilize or seat these culvert crossings with rock. 
uh, sandbags can uh, be used. Uh, I've seen hay bales that are staked out and used. Just make sure you don't get any of the sediment, you know, from the crossing into the stream. Here's an example of uh, a couple of permanent crossings that uh, culverts that were put in extremely well. You can see they're uh, extending a foot or more, you know, past the field. The field is, is usually rock uh, around uh, the facings of those culverts. Um, that's keeping a lot of sediment from getting into the stream. Then you have a good base over it. Uh, you don't want to put your, your fill over the top of the crossing, uh, uh, excuse me, the culvert, and have it less than a foot. You want at least a foot or more of fill over the top of that culvert when you put it in. Just make sure, number one, you don't uh, crush your culvert when you go over it, and you have a good pad uh, where your, your traffic or your log trucks can get over and not have to worry about causing any problems or any cave-ins, you know, with that culvert installation. And this is several examples of uh, culverts that have failed. Uh, the one on the top left, it was not packed in good. It, it didn't have, it wasn't stabilized very well. All they used was uh, loose fill around this culvert and you know, your first major rain, this is what happens. It's, it's going to wash out a lot of that fill and it's going to get into that stream and you're going to have some major pollution problems, sedimentation problems. On the bottom right is a culvert that uh, you didn't have adequate fill on top of the, the, the culvert and it was crushed. So, what I was talking about earlier, make sure they're stabilized good, uh, use a proper stabilizing agent, whether it's rock, sandbags, uh, whatever, uh, but do, do not just use loose soil to pack it in. And make sure your cover on that culvert uh, over the top of it is at least a, a foot or more deep. Bridges are probably your, your easiest crossing to use. Uh, one of the best, that, you know, in my opinion, to use because they create the least amount of disruption of stream flow. Uh, you still have to stabilize your banks and fill material uh, to prevent erosion with these when they're put in and taken out. Uh, but you, you don't have to go through all the effort of uh, you know, packing in a culvert or putting in several logs you know, for a log crossing. These can be just put in you know, in one, one move and then you know, when you're done, pull them out, stabilize your, your bank areas and you know, you're gone. I mean, everything's taken care of. Uh, one thing to remember on these, the spans must be installed uh, to permit passage of expected high water flow. Um, make sure that, you know, they come far enough across that the stream bank to where in case the water comes up that you, you don't have to worry about these uh, bridges floating off. Here's an example of a portable bridge. Uh, as you see in this slide, you know, they extend pretty good ways on either side of the, the stream bank. Uh, this is a pretty heavy duty bridge. I don't think you'll have any problems out of that. Uh, and, and you're not really disrupting a whole lot of the, you know, the buffer area, the vegetative area that exists, uh, you know, on either side of that crossing. So. And these last a long time, so if at all possible, you know, get a portable bridge that you can take around from job site to job site. I, I promise you it will pay for itself, you know, with the work and effort uh, that you would have to do with some of these other crossings. You know, it will definitely pay for itself in the future. All right, let's uh, talk about forest roads now. As with any of your BMPs, proper planning and location should be used uh, to minimize the potential for pollutants, you know, coming off of these forest roads. With ad adequate drainage is the most important factor to consider, you know, when you put these forest roads in. Uh, it's a matter of getting, uh, you know, making sure the uh, sedimentation is, is not taken from these roads and can go into a stream. 
So uh, several of the different ways to uh, build these roads, maintain adequate drainage is uh, crowning your roads. Everybody's heard of crowned and ditched roads. Uh, you know, water's able to flow off the top of these roads and stay in ditches and then go down into turnouts, which can be put into, you know, any, any sediment flow can be put within a vegetative area that way. Uh, you have outslope roads, uh, which slope away into, uh, you know, an area of vegetative area. Inslope roads, which usually, you know, have a ditch that, and turnouts involved with that. Broad base dips, you know, these are your, you know, smaller water bars with the dips to channel water off the road into uh, vegetative areas. Uh, one of the things you see most often is water bars with turnouts. You consider with water bars is putting these in at a proper angle, like a 45 or 50 degree angle, and the right height uh, to make sure that, you know, water is, is adequately diverted off the roads into areas of vegetative cover. Another real important fact to think about on water bars is packing these water bars in, uh, just so when it rains it doesn't just doesn't wash your water bar out. And one of the main things is just controlling non-essential traffic. Uh, this may re require putting up a, a cable gate or a, 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 a steel gate you know, just keeping unwanted traffic off those roads so you can maintain the integrity of your roads. You don't want to spend a whole lot of money uh, doing all this road work and make sure you have these great roads and then have Joe Blow come in and mud ride all over your property and destroy all the work that you've done. And believe me, I've, I've seen this where it's happened. So try to control the traffic on and off these roads, whether it's using uh, uh, a cable or a gate, some way to keep people out. Uh, it's a good idea to always put rock at the entrance uh, on your logging site. That's, that's to keep a lot of mud off the road. And I get calls all the time, hey, uh, this guy's got a major problem over here. He's, he's pulling all this mud out on the road. And you know that, that happens in a lot of different logging sites. Uh, it's a good idea to rock, you know, these entrances to where you can clean your tires off before you get out onto the road. I know in Georgia in the past uh, when I was uh, doing some logging uh, jobs, uh, DOT required that you put in rock at every entrance where the logging trucks were going to come out. And this had to be 150, 200 feet of rock you know, to clean the tires off before you, you came out on the main road. So it's always a good thing to consider, you know, uh, at, when, when you have one of these logging jobs and you're coming out into a main road, make sure you rock it really good. Here's an example of a in-service forest road that was put in. Um, uh, so you probably in the when you're done with this, you need to come back and crown this road and ditch it a little bit and put in water bars where you can divert the water off this road, you know, into the stand, uh, into just different vegetative areas within the stand. Here's an example of a crown and ditched road. Uh, water's able to run off these uh, roads very easily, um, keeps them from rutting up uh, a lot. So that water's moving off the top of that road into the ditches and going away from the road into that vegetative layer. Uh, so crowned and ditched roads are a good way to keep that water off of roads. Here's a very steep forest road that was put in. Um, you can see there were pretty major water bars, turnouts that was put in. And the steeper uh, the slope on these roads, the more water bars you're going to have to put in. If you look in our BMP manual, you'll see just how many uh, per feet in between water bars you'll have to use, you know, depending upon slope. Um, so you can see where there would be the potential for uh, uh, BMP problems or sedimentation problems on this road because usually at the bottom there's going to be uh, a stream or major waterway that exist. You want to keep that sediment out of 
out of that stream. Here's a road where they use mats for stabilizing uh, uh, the road. Um, you know, a lot of people use these coming in and out of tracks to keep mud off the, the main road. But it also helps protect that road uh, while you're there logging. And these are, these are easy to remove once you, uh, you're finished and pack up and move on. You just pull those up and take them with you. And here we're going to get into some slides involving forest road problems. And you see in this slide, you have some major rutting uh, on this road crossing uh, an SMZ, a stream, no doubt. Uh, all that sediment is going to flow down that, that road into that stream, and, and you're going to have some major problems. Another example of uh, a steep road uh, or skid trail going down into an SMZ. As you can see in this skid trail, there weren't any water diversion devices put in, um, no turnouts, uh, no slash put in. So all that loose soil sediment is going to be able to go straight down the hill into that stream. A lot of time brush piles are not good substitutes for water bars or turnouts especially if there's a lot of slope involved in the approaches going to these uh, SMZ streamside crossings. Uh, it's better to use uh, where you have a lot of uh, topography, a lot of slope to use silt fencing, um, using a lot of larger water bars, um, you know, on these uh, four water diversion devices. And where you have your turnouts, have hay bales, and silt fencing to turn that water out into a hay bale to where it doesn't make its way down into the stream. Like I say, you know, putting a pile or two isn't going to help slow that uh, mo movement of sediment down into the stream. Uh, this would have been a better situation in this slide to use a couple of big water bars going up there and, and turning that water into that vegetative layer on either side. And this is what happens uh, when you don't put in these water diversion devices. That once you have a good rainfall, um, all this loose soil or sediment is able to move down these slopes into these streams. And this is what's causing your pollution problems into the streams and eventually into somebody's pond or actually into the river. So that's why it's so important to put these water diversion devices in to keep this sed sediment out of the, the streams. Like I'm saying some of your remediation work after, after you're done may involve putting in hay bales, silt fencing, um, water bars, turnouts, all these to control any movement of sediment from roads, skid trails, uh, interior roads into streams where they're going to cause pollution problems. And you see, as you can see in this slide, uh, you have silt fencing, hay bales put in. Uh, it's a good idea to put, put down some hay, some grass seed. Uh, I tell people all the time, you know, it, it's very, very inexpensive to use hay and grass seed to help stabilize some of these areas along with hay bales. Uh, make sure uh, you have a good vegetative layer that keeps that sediment from moving into these streams. Here's another example of using hay and grass seed. Um, you know, it's in the bottom part of that slide. That's been uh, hayed and grass seeded very well along with the silt fencing to keep uh, sediment from moving, you know, into these low-lying areas. Here's some of your grass mats or enviro, enviro mats that can be used to put, be, uh, put, down, put down those and put grass seed on top of those and, and help stabilize the, the soil surface. The biggest, the biggest thing I'm trying to get across to everyone here is 
to stabilize these surfaces. If you see an area that, expo that is exposed and has a lot of bare soil uh, visible, these areas need to be stabilized, especially uh, where they're on a slope and they're going down into uh, a streamside area, whether it's a perennial or intermittent stream. Uh, make sure you stabilize these approaches or slopes going down into these streams. Uh, we have steep roads, make sure they're, they're stabilized efficiently. All right, this is another part of our uh, BMPs, uh, one of the core areas is timber harvesting. Um, uh, it's a great idea to make sure that you plan or have a, a pre-harvest plan in place before you ever, ever move on to the track of timber that you're cutting. Make sure that you know where all your roads and landings will be located. Uh, what's going to need to be stabilized uh, when completed, where your bad slopes are, uh, probably where you need to put in some skid trails, where your crossings may be. Um, biggest thing is to minimize your rutting, compaction, and ponding, you know, on these uh, logging sites, especially where the, uh, the loading deck is located. Um, make sure that you dispose of all the trash that is left. That's one of the, my biggest pet peeves is uh, pulling up to a, a, a harvest track and noticing a bunch of bright yellow hydraulic buckets laying around everywhere. I promise you my inspection is going to get a lot more detailed if I see a lot of buckets laying around and uh, of course, this is one telltale sign of uh, fuel spills. If I see a lot of hydraulic buckets, I know you had a, uh, I know you had a hydraulic leak at one point in time during this operation. Uh, whether it's minor or major, uh, I'm going to find it, um, and that goes into uh, protecting our streams from any any pollutant getting in there. Uh, and ADM requires anything less than 25 uh, uh, gallons be treated on site and removed. If it's more than 25 gallons and you have uh, a major spill, you need to contact ADM and let them know so that uh, proper steps can be taken to remove uh, these fluids. And number one, make sure they don't get into uh, a waterway, uh, a, main, a main creek or stream that can transport these into rivers and ponds. Uh, we want to stay away from logging or harvesting when it's very wet. Um, I see this quite a bit with a lot of the complaints that I have. Excessive rutting. Uh, you know when it's too wet to uh, to not be logging. Uh, stay, stay away from the tracks and stay away from cutting and harvesting when the conditions are too wet. You can always go back to these tracks later, you know, when conditions are drier. Uh, these problems like this, these slides right here, um, uh, they're hard to fix, but they, they do need to be fixed because these can transport water into uh, streams and carry sediment as well. So you know when it's too wet to, to log, so don't do it. Like I was talking about earlier with the hydraulic buckets, I hate to see this on uh, logging jobs and I will make a thorough inspection if I see a lot of hydraulic buckets laying around. It doesn't take long to load these in the back of your truck and take them with you. Uh, not only the buckets, but the filters, uh, the the lunchtime trash, you know, wrappers, cans, bottles. You know, it's a good idea to have a on-site big trash can that you can just put all the stuff in, and uh, when it's full, take it home with you, put it into a trash receptacle, and get it off that property. A lot, a lot of times, I tell uh, loggers where that have these problems, you don't want people putting trash on your property. So why leave your trash on theirs? Um, just be considerate 
and of someone else's property and take this trash with you. Going on to fluid spills, uh, and this happens on a lot of logging operations. You might have a hydraulic hose bust. It's a good idea to immediately shut that equipment down, uh, replace that hose so that you limit the, the, the fluid spill uh, on that, that property. Uh, if you know you've got a, a, a hose that's leaking, um, don't sit there and continue to, you know, run that skidder or run that cutter or loader. Go ahead and get that, that hose fixed where you don't leak fluid all over uh, someone else's property. Like I said, just replace the hose. Don't quit bandaging up a problem that can be fixed properly. Uh, if you know you have a leak, go ahead and, and repair it. Um, another part, the main core of our uh, state BMPs is reforestation. Uh, this takes into uh, consideration your mechanical site prep, uh, chemical site prep. Um, make sure this is done properly on your mechanical site prep. Make sure that uh, uh, this is done um, on a contour. Uh, you don't you stay away from the SMZ areas. Make sure your machine planning is on the contour. Uh, if you're using herbicides or pesticides, make sure they're uh, the right mixtures are applied. Do not overspray into your SMZ areas. Uh, always check your your weather conditions. Um, make sure there's not a uh, it's not a real windy day if you're going to apply herbicides or pesticides so that it drifts over into your SMZ areas and kills you know, the trees that you've taken all that time to, to uh, leave. Make sure your fertilization is done properly. Uh, you don't want that nutrient flow into the streams, so you want to have a buffer of where you put your fertilizer um, and make sure it is, is kept away from uh, your SMZs. If you're putting in fire lanes, um, if you have slope, make sure you're still using uh, fire breaks where you're putting your fire, uh, or, uh, excuse me, let me go back. Where you're putting in your fire lanes, make sure that you're using your water uh, diversion devices, water bars uh, properly to where you have, if you're putting in uh, fire lanes where there's a lot of slope involved, make sure that uh, uh, you have proper water bars put in. Uh, so if you go back and you do some prescribed burning, um, you have to refresh some of these fire lanes or fire breaks, make sure these water bars are put back in. Here's an example of uh, improper site prep. Um, this, was, this was actually uh, site prep good to begin with, then the landowner side, he wanted to take his dozer back in and run his dozer up and down the slope and uh, smooth it out a little bit better. Well, what he did was cause, uh, you know, ruts, uh, you know, where he left his tracks going up and down this slope. And, you know, your first couple inches of rain with a significant rainfall is going to cause that sediment movement, you know, down that slope because there was no stabilization efforts put in at that time and uh, you got a major problem. All right, let's talk a little bit about conversions. Um, conversions are not covered by the section 404 exception, uh, with the exception that a landowner must get a permit. If you're converting a forested area to uh, uh, a residential or commercial area, of course you must contact uh, ADEM or Corps Engineers and get the proper 404 permit for that conversion. Um, if, uh, if you're converting uh, a wetland to an upland, you definitely need to get uh, that permit. It's a good idea not to even attempt that to begin with. Uh, but if you're, you know, all these upland conversions 
uh, you should get an MPDES permit from ADEM. And you can, you can read about this more in our uh, Alabama Best Management Practices uh, manual. Uh, it goes over all your Section 404 e exemptions, uh, when you need uh, a permit and when you do not need a permit. All right, so switching gears a little bit, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the state BMP complaints uh, for the last two years. In fiscal year 2018, we had 39 total BMP complaints received. Uh, these complaints were either uh, phony complaints sent from concerned landowners or cons uh, complaints that were sent into ADEM, which were forwarded to the Alabama Forestry Commission. Uh, there were 36 BMP complaints and three U.S. Army Corps Engineer wetland complaints uh, that were made in 2018. Out of these different complaints, there were 13 valid standard complaints. Uh, the two uh, complaints involving wetlands were also valid. Um, you had two ag conversions and 22 of these total complaints were not valid. A lot of times that's just a disgruntled landowner, adjacent landowner that doesn't like the fact that his neighbor's cutting timber and uh, calls in and makes a complaint. So we get a lot of those every year. Um, most B&P violations in 2018 were minor, minor and quickly remediated. So uh, it, it was pretty fairly easy year in, in 2018. Not a whole lot of complaints. Um, we started seeing a different trend in uh, 2019. A few more complaints, 21, I mean, excuse me, 41 that were received. Of these, 15 were valid, 18 were not valid, and there were eight conversions, which did not require uh, AFC involvement. Um, most of the valid BMP violations in 2019 appeared that so folks were getting in a little bit of a hurry, getting too much in a hurry to finish the track they're cutting and move off and not doing the remediation work that was involved to implement your BMPs, uh, or just cutting too many corners. Or they could have just been uh, totally negligent and some of these were pretty atrocious. So. When you finish your track, when you finish harvesting your track, make sure you, with your planning, go through all your BMP implementation procedures. What do we need to remediate? What kind of work do we need to do to close out the track before you leave and move on to the next track? Some of the reoccurring problems that we see on a lot of these timber harvests or timber operations uh, or the roads not being stabilized. You know, if you've got a road on a steep slope, uh, make sure you put your water bars in, your turnouts. Um, saw a lot of different roads that did not have any water bars, turnouts, anything. Uh, we're, see, we're still seeing a lot of muddy ponds um, where you have improper SMZs and you have silt getting into these perennial and intermittent streams that go to someone, your neighbor's pond, uh, first thing they're going to do is call the ADM or the Forestry Commission and complain about their muddy pond. And before you know it, you have a lawsuit on your hands. So make sure with your planning that you protect these SMZs or streams by uh, providing the proper streamside management zones. And if anything else, go above and beyond and, and make your SMZs wider. Still seeing a lot of fluid spills on uh, some of these logging operations around the loading deck. So repair those hydraulic fittings, hoses, uh, when they're leaking as soon as possible to make sure that you don't have a reoccurring leak. And, you know, probably our biggest complaint involves uh, stream crossings or creek crossings. And a lot of what I've seen uh, in this past year are crossings that are put in using 
dirt, uh, logging slash debris, uh, just packing it in and not removing it or improperly removing it and stabilizing those crossings. So just remember as a rule of thumb, anything that you put in has to be pulled back out of the stream and those crossings stabilized. Uh, 2019, uh, these are some of our numbers for our random closed out uh, track inspection year. And I'll, I'll briefly go over that. Uh, out of all of our counties, we have so many inspections that we have per county. Uh, and this is all dependent upon how much uh, wood production is, is uh, made by each county. Uh, where you have, you know, a lot of meals within counties or close to these different counties like Clark, uh, Butler, Marengo, you're going to have a higher amount of inspections that should be done each year. Um, up in North Alabama, you might have one or, one or two inspections per county that are done. Uh, but this is what we did last year. Uh, we were 98.7% uh, implementation on harvesting, 97.5% on forest roads, 97.6% implementation on stream crossings, 98.3% implement implementation on SMZs. So uh, all of you loggers out there, uh, you're doing a great job. Keep up what you're doing. Uh, you know, it seems like we're, our BMP complaints are starting to get a little bit lower each year now. I know as of currently, we have uh, 32 uh, BMP complaints for um, this year. Uh, I expect, and this, you know, our fiscal year runs out the end of September. So we're probably going to be around that mid-30s level. So they're starting to slowly go down. And that's, that's because of you and because of what you do, uh, attending these classes and learning more about BMPs and BMP implementation. You're taking this that you learn and taking it out into the field and using it. And I applaud you for that. And I applaud you for that, and I appreciate all your hard work and what you're doing to help protect the BMPs. So keep it up, everyone. Uh, everybody's doing a great job especially when you can get 98.2% overall implementation rate uh, for the year. So congratulations. So if anyone has any questions, uh, any comments, um, I will I'll actually be on this call. I know this is kind of a weird way to do it. Uh, and it beats anything I've ever seen because I'd rather be in front of everyone and talking and cutting up and having a good time and making sure you know everything about BMPs. Uh, but we're not able to do that right now during these crazy times. Uh, so any, any questions, any concerns, uh, here's my office number, my cell phone number, my email, uh, any, any, any BMP material that you uh, have that you need, you can contact our AFC uh, site. Um, but feel free to call me if, if you have any questions on logging jobs and uh, you're not quite sure, you know, about the BMPs, uh, with, what you're, with what you need to do to finish out your BMP remediation work, feel free to call me. That's, that's my job. That's what, what I do best. I go out and, and give you advice on technical advice and uh, on how to fix these issues or, or how to keep them from becoming problems. So please call me if you have any questions or concerns, you know, when you're out there logging. And please, everyone, stay safe. Um, uh, hopefully we'll be done with this COVID-19 stuff before long and everybody can get out and, you know, intermingle and it'll get back to usual. But uh, in the meantime, everybody stay, stay safe and wear those masks when you need to and, and uh, hope the best for you and your families and have a great day. Take care.